Um, okay. I want to welcome all of you here today. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, uh, introduce Michael uh, Hawley, who is a postdoc in our Duke program. He got his PhD at Duke. He was an undergraduate at Tufts. Um, he's got a book coming out with Oxford University Press. I, I won't go into great detail since I sent all CV out with everybody else. And he's, this is uh, his talk today uh, really is a part of a second book project, which is on political rhetoric. So without further ado, Michael. Uh, great, thank you very much, Michael, uh, for, for hosting me here um, and to Jeff Church for organizing uh, this. As I understand our procedure, uh, I'm supposed to assume you've read the paper, so I'm not really gonna try to summarize it. Um, instead, I'll just talk a little bit about where it came from and a little bit of where it's going, that larger project Michael referred to. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about some of the issues I think it raises that I'd be especially eager to have feature in our discussion. Um, in choosing a paper, I wanted to give something relatively polished, but which also uh, would, would gain from feedback. So this is at the R&R stage. So I am still very eager to have people's uh, feedback on it. Um, I think the first question uh, I should answer is why Frederick Douglass? So if you did look at my CV, my early work is not on him. And I do think sometimes when we do history of political thought work, uh, it takes the form of us sort of sitting at the feet of one of our favorite thinkers, waiting for pearls of wisdom to drop to us that we can share with others. Uh, I definitely do that sometimes, but that isn't the origin of this paper. I started with a puzzle, and then I cast about looking for some thinker I thought was alive to the same puzzle. Uh, and once I found him, I began putting my questions to him. And the puzzle is basically as follows. Um, ever since theorizing about political rhetoric began with Plato and Aristotle, the dominant mode of thinking about its legitimate use seems to be persuasion, is changing minds. You think one thing, or at least are unsure about it, and after the speaker is done with you, you think whatever it is they want you to think about that particular subject. Um, and that runs from Plato and Aristotle up to most modern discussions of uh, political rhetoric by theorists, and in fact, also by, by empirical scholars. Um, but as I sat watching candidates for the presidency in the last couple of elections lead their followers in chants or give speeches where every other line features an applause break, I thought there's really not much persuasion going on here, right? Like regardless of what you think of, of Donald Trump, no one listens to a chant of like lock her up and thinks, well, I was thinking about voting for Hillary Clinton, but this is a good point and I've changed my mind. Like, and this is, this is not meant to be a partisan point. I, the, the, both sides do it. And not even just in sort of what you might think are low electioneering speeches. Uh, I think Churchill's We Shall Fight Them on the Beaches is an example of this kind of, of speech. You know, Shakespeare's Henry V, you know, once more into the breach, dear friends. Um, Something else is going on in this kind of speech. The speaker seems to assume that the audience agrees with them, that the audience doesn't need its mind changed. Um, and so my puzzle is just what is going on? Shouldn't this be a waste of air? And if it is efficacious in some way, what sort of moral and political implications are there for this kind of speech? And Frederick Douglass, it seems to me, was not only a master of this way of speaking, but he actually gives an account of why someone might engage in it. Um, and he was in fact trained, at least to a certain extent, in the classical tradition of rhetoric as persuasion. And I think fairly early on in his career, he started to see that vision as incomplete. Um, Douglas recognizes something that, that I think Aristotle doesn't, or, or maybe more precisely, he accepts something that Aristotle rejects, which is that human beings don't always act on their own considered judgment. Um, his what to the slave is the 4th of July speech, I think is a perfect example of this. The audience is an anti-slavery society. They know slavery is wrong and should be abolished. Uh, but at least as far as Douglas is concerned, they're not acting on it or they're not acting on it enough. Um, they're suffering from what the ancient Greeks would call acrasia or weakness of will, where you know you should do something, where you've decided you should do something, but you're not doing it, right? It's the same sort of thing and I'm speaking completely hypothetically here, where you know you have an important you know, talk to give. And as you know this, 
Instead of preparing for it, you're watching YouTube videos about unlikely animal friendships, right? Like, and at that very moment, you know you should be working on this talk. Again, this is this is no one I know. I've just I've just heard stories. Um, but if this is real, if this sort of uh, phenomenon is real, a speaker who wants to address this problem probably won't speak like someone who wants to persuade, right? They won't make concessions to the other side. They'll perhaps even deny that there's anything to be said on the other side of an issue. Instead, what you'll get is something that looks a lot more like a locker room speech from a sports movie, like a pep talk, right? You know, any given Sunday or remember the Titans, that kind of sort of rhetoric. Um, or more appropriately, and in, in, to Douglas's case, I think a certain kind of homily. Um, I think the, the idea of sin rests on the notion that you know you ought not to do something, but you do it anyway, or vice versa. Uh, and I think it's no accident that one of Douglas's first jobs as a free man was an exhorter. This is the name of the term uh, at his church, where his job wasn't really to elucidate finer points of scripture, but rather to be rousing to make the wickedness of what people already know to be sin felt and the joys of righteousness similarly emotionally present to people. Um, and so in What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, for instance, he sort of explicitly rules out persuasion as his aim. He imagines someone saying to him, well, if you would persuade more and rebuke less, you might succeed more. And his response to that is, where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. And then he goes on to say, not light, but fire is what's needed. You need ridicule and reproach and blistering criticism. Um, and anyway, if you've read the paper, you can see where this line of reasoning takes you. Um, I'm open to, to sort of following the discussion wherever it, wherever it may lead, but there are a couple of um, sort of issues that I think this sort of speech raises that I'd be especially eager to talk about, both moral and sort of just conceptual theoretical. Um, so the first is I'm curious as to whether or not people find the psychological account I draw out of Douglas persuasive. I think that a lot rests on whether or not you think acrasia is a real phenomenon. Aristotle considers it, but in, in the ethics, he concludes with some nuance that it's an illusion. He decides that uh, it really does not exist. And while he doesn't draw the logical connection to rhetoric, I think his theory of rhetoric follows very naturally from his position on acracy, which is um, if people can be counted on to follow, to act on their judgments, then persuasion is really all any orator is going to need, any rhetorician is going to need. Once you change your mind about what you want to do, you'll do the new thing that you've decided. Um, whereas if Douglas is right, it's possible for, in his words, for people to assent, but not be moved. And in that case, I do think this kind of hortatory rhetoric is, is uh, something that needs to be considered as an alternative. Um, and if that's the case, this has consequences far beyond the issue of rhetoric. For instance, I think it causes serious problems for the platonic thesis that virtue is knowledge, for instance, because now it's possible to know the good, but not to do it. Um, and that maybe you do need something like Christianity with its notion of the sin, with, with its notion of sin and the will to make this kind of speech intelligible. Of all the classical rhetorical theorists, I think Augustine, unsurprisingly, gets closest to recognizing this as a certain kind of a different kind of speech. Um, another line of reasoning I'd be interested in exploring is. Uh, assuming this kind of hortatory rhetoric is possible, to what extent can you combine it with persuasion? The very same time Douglas is doing what he's doing, Lincoln seems to tend far more in the direction of persuasion. Um, he says as much, in fact, in his, his, his temperance speech, even though that's not explicitly about slavery. Um, but that involves making concessions to people on the fence. Um, you know, Lincoln will give a speech saying, look, if you, if you hate race mixing, for instance, that's a reason to abolish slavery, which might change some people's minds on abolition, but it's dispiriting to abolitionists who are already on your side, right, making these sort of racist concessions. And Douglas himself says he was dispirited to hear Lincoln make those kinds of speeches. Um, hence my, my notion of the orator's dilemma that you might at least sometimes have to choose between the two. Um, and then the last, the last sort of possibility or, or line of reasoning I'll throw out before I'll wrap up here um, is what sort of image of citizenship and of politics is at stake in a scenario in which you're engaging in hortatory rhetoric. 
right? So persuasion, it seems to me, calls to mind a sort of citizen body that does look like at least an idealized version of the ancient Greek polis and what, what you would expect of citizens there, which is that the ordinary citizen's judgment may be swayed by emotions to a, to a certain extent, but citizens can be counted on to be self-commanding enough to act on those judgments once they're made. So the speaker audience dynamic, it seems to me in the persuasive model is more egalitarian, at least when it comes to the perspective of the virtue of self-command, right? The speaker is gonna have to stoop to conquer by making concessions to the beliefs of, of the audience, um, but they count on the audience to act once they've made up their mind. And on the other hand, I think the speaker in the persuasive model claims a certain kind of epistemological superiority over their audience, right? They do have to say something like, I know what's right and you don't, and that's why I'm trying to persuade you. Um, and it seems to me that the reverse is true in persuasive, uh, in, in hortatory rhetoric, the sort that, that Douglas engages in, where the, the orator doesn't claim to be epistemologically privileged. They say, you know the right thing too. You know it in your heart as well as I do. But the speaker claims a certain kind of moral superiority in that the speaker claims to be able to act on this judgment, right? That the audience isn't capable of doing. Um, and I think this has implications also for questions about demagoguery, um, about entrenched partisanship, that what happens when you speak frequently in, the, in the, the sort of register, that there's nothing to be said on the other side of an issue. Um, and so any of these are things I'd be open to, to discussing uh, now that we are going to throw it open to a discussion, um, as well as anything else anyone would, would be excited to talk about. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll wrap it up there. Michael, I think you're... Um... Yeah, yeah. If, thank you, Michael. And, and if people will just uh, in chat, send me a text that you'd like to speak, I'll keep a cue and call on people. Michael, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know. I cannot get back to you. I went to Jeff church and now I don't know how to get back to you to put myself on the queue. Oh, just use the general chat. So Brad, Brad, Bradley start and, and it, 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 Jeff, if you get something, just send it on to, to general chat. How do I do that? Uh, if you change, if you go to where it says two and you hit the down arrow, it will give you everyone. And that's where you want to put it. So I have Bradley first and then Jeff Church. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, Michael, oh, sorry. Uh, Bradley and Aline. Thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, first, thank you for your papers. Is, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, my own research right now is um, specifically on Douglas. So it was, it was uh, nice to see a fresh set of eyes uh, on, on his thinking. And um, I was persuaded by your uh, presentation of the ordinative, uh, 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 I guess the ordinative aspect, right, of, um, of, of rhetoric. And, but one of the questions you had, i.e., do we need to choose between persuasion and ordinative? I think actually Douglas uh, looking maybe perhaps at a bit more of his speeches would show that he blends the two far more closely than maybe your paper suggests. And I don't think that's necessarily a pushback on the paper, but I think you can maybe fine tune it a little bit. Um, and there's two specific speeches that I think can help you with this. Um, one is uh, a speech on the anti-slavery constitution, the one particularly given at Glasgow in uh, Scotland in 1860. Um, and then the other one is a speech on the anti-slavery movement uh, in 1855. Because uh, Douglas, he he's occupying a position within the abolitionist movement uh, that is somewhat caught between uh, two different strains. One is the Garrisonian strain, right? That is stressing uh, not only this pro-slavery constitution, but uh, with that, there's sort of this perfectionism that denies any sort of political participation. So when we're talking about, well, they know what's right, but they simply uh, won't act on what's right. Well, it might be a little bit more complicated in Douglas's context because you have certain people who are arguing based on what's right, you ought to do nothing. Um, and then there's this other strain, right, which uh, maybe you could say is maybe the more Lincolnian, 
uh, strain, which is saying, well, yes, uh, we, we all abide, let's say, by the same natural rights theory, but uh, based on how we understand that vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution and our own political situation, it requires a different call to action. And so in some respects, um, what I see him doing with this sort of hortative approach uh, borders on persuasion a lot of the time. And I wonder if that blends the two uh, more so than maybe your paper suggests. Now, I think there's certainly times where he maybe elects one over the other, but there's certain, certainly a lot of blending as well. And maybe addressing that, maybe even just a little bit uh, sort of these, these tensions within the abolition movement and how he's using these two different modes um, and how they can maybe even perhaps blend together might strengthen the paper. Great, no, thank you. I really, I, I very much appreciate this. And, and um, I think you're right. And I don't want to give the impression that these are two mutually exclusive modes of speaking. I do think it's perfectly conceivable for someone to try to combine them um, but in the same speech. Um, so I think even the, what to the slave is the 4th of July, there's there's definitely persuasion going on on other issues besides the, the rightness of slavery, right? He's engaging the Garrisonians on the question of whether or not the constitution is a anti-slavery document or not. And he takes a persuasive approach there. And I do even think it's possible to combine the hortatory and the persuasive on the same subject in the same speech. I do think it's possible to try to change people's minds and then try to rev them up about whatever it is that you're talking about. Um, but I do think that at least some of the time, and this is, this is the sort of narrow and precise claim I'm trying to make, at least some of the time, the tactics involved in both work at cross purposes. So if you're trying to persuade people who don't agree with you, you do tend to have to make certain kinds of concessions and moderate your language in order to bring them on your side. And that can be kind of deflating to people who are already on your side and want a pep talk and vice versa. And I think it's, it's, it's more clear in the opposite case. Um, revving people up who are on your side can turn people off. And there, there are accounts of Douglas's speeches, right? Where he seems to give a hortatory speech that simply enrages the people who are opposed to him. Like it, it has no persuasive effect at all. Um, and so I do think I could, I can improve this paper by drawing more attention to the cases where Douglas combines both. But I do wanna make it clear, I don't think they're impossible to combine. I do think first you have to think about them separately though to, to figure out how they can be combined. So thank you. Um, oh, and one thing I just remembered that I, I wanted to add also, uh, yeah. it, one, one of the things you mentioned how like sometimes it's a sacrifice, right? To have the ordered approach because you're actually drawing away uh, mm. those who might not agree with you. Um, but especially in this context, it's rather interesting that Douglas sometimes purposefully chooses this because in a lot of, in a large sense, he's trying to incense the South, right? As well as incense a lot of others because his sort of uh, take on this, at least I think is, well, if we're going to effectively achieve abolition, we need to bring this conflict to a head. Uh, we can't, uh, let's say, skirt around it or or find ways to merely persuade, um, but we need to actually draw out uh, the conflict. So in a way, it's almost purposeful, right? And maybe, I don't know, that could be maybe added as well, how he was very purposeful, right? And wanting to uh, draw away or, or incense the opposite side. Yeah, I think it's entirely fair to say that sometimes alienating your opponents is a feature, not a bug. Of a, of a certain kind of, of hortatory rhetoric. Um, yeah, I'm entirely prepared to, to go along with that. I do think there are times, and it is, it's hard to say even um, in Douglas's case, whether or not, um, how you could possibly evaluate the costs and benefits of that, right? Like how many people, how many persuadables do you lose when you take that approach um, who might have made your cause you know, easier to triumph in? But I do think you're right that Douglas, at times is counting on the fact that he will enrage people. I think that's entirely fair. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I have Alan or Aline. I can't, I can't quite make that out. Yeah, no, no, Aline is good. Yeah, very good actually. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thanks, thanks, Michael. There are a lot of Michaels around today, but <laughs> thank you, Michael Holly. <laughs> It was a very, very uh, impressive paper, in all honesty. 
but I like to play a little bit of devil advocate here and and have a few questions. Maybe you can plug in some holes that I find in your argument. So I start with the subtle one and basically the bigger biggest one. The the difference between persuasion and uh, hortation. Mm -hmm. So you say hortation, it's a spur. And you give the example of uh, Churchill, for example. And by the way, I know that you are also working on Islamic political thought spur and the wheel. It's something that Al-Farabi talks a lot about. Yeah. And he actually uses the word spur. I was wondering if you are, if you took the spur wording from Al-Farabi or not. But anyway, going back is like, okay, but if I want to spur someone, I'm trying basically to persuade it. I mean, I can buy the argument that, yes, I know I should quit smoking, rationally speaking, mm -hmm. but my will is not strong enough to quit smoking or whatever addiction you want to pick, right? Mm -hmm. And I need a spur. I can understand the distinction, but I think it should be made a little bit clear in, in the paper. That, that's my one small thing. The, the other one is like pages like 23, 24, you say Douglas is a theorist of the distinction between the two, mm. which implies that he was very much aware of the distinction between the two types of rhetoric. So then, was the novelty since he's using the same approach as the prophets from the Old Testament. So the prophets of the Old Testament that were using the same portatoric rhetoric were also theorists of rhetoric. I, I don't really buy this red theorist argument, neither for Douglas nor for the prophets of the Old Testament. And in terms of success, the, I mean, they were not very successful, neither Douglas nor the prophets of the Old Testament, in all honesty. Uh, and, uh, uh, okay, I have, no, I, I'll stop here. Well, no, I have one more, but it's a small one. I have other more, but the Churchill one hmm. is like, Okay, so you say Churchill's argument, like, let me quote here, let it end only when each of one us lies choking on in his own blood upon the ground, was a uh, hortatory rhetoric. Well, why did it not work in Vichy regime in France across the channel? So if people were convinced that we are already ready to die and choke on our own blood until we 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 uh, uh, conceive defeat. Why the French did not? So the same speech spoke by Churchill in the French National Assembly or whatever it was back then at Vichy. I don't think it would be like, whoa, yeah, let's die all here. <laughs> okay, thank. You. Thank you. All right. So I'll, I'll try to work through all three, all three of your, your comments or, or provocations. To the first, actually, despite spending a decent amount of time with Al-Farabi, I hadn't thought to connect the issue of spur there. To, uh, maybe, maybe it's sunk into my, self, my subconscious. I'd be, uh, glad, I'd be glad to, to send you the, the exact paragraph, I mean, the exact pages where he talks okay. about wheels and the spur. I would, I would appreciate that. Um, I'm going to skip to your third one then and say, I am by no means think that examples of, of hortatory rhetoric always have to work, right? So those of us who, who remember the, was it the, was it the 2008 election? I think the Howard Dean scream speech is a perfect example of a failed effort at hortatory rhetoric. That's the one where he goes like, we're gonna go on to Iowa and Michigan and North Carolina. And then he gives this sort of screech that I won't do right now for reasons of professionalism. Um, but like that one clearly did not work. Um, and so I'm not, I don't think I'm committed to the idea that hortatory rhetoric always has to work. And I think part of what one has to concede to Churchill is he was, he was a genius. He was a master of, of rhetoric. I think it was Edward R. Murrow who said he marshaled the English language and sent it into battle. And in fact, it may be that you, 
that, that hortatory rhetoric especially doesn't work as well in translation. Because I do think, as I sort of allude to in the paper, hortatory rhetoric does work in many ways on a, such a subrational level. It depends on things like poetry and rhythm. It is much more conducive to being heard rather than being read, though I don't think it's impossible to experience it in written form. Um, as for the business about Douglas being a theorist and the, the Old Testament prophets being a theorist, I, I, I want to deny that I think that Douglas thought it was his main job to be coming up with a theory of rhetoric like this. Um, I, I essentially take him to be theorizing in passing as he's doing it. But I do think what makes him a theorist of it is his account, say in What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, where he gives a, a, a theoretic a distinction between the two. He imagines someone saying, why aren't you persuading? Why are you speaking in this other way? And then gives an account of why he would abandon persuasion in this particular moment and speak in this other way. Um, and I do think that sort of the work of this kind of history of political thought that I'm trying to do here is to try to draw out those conclusions from the sort of that, that are only partially, that are, that are partly explicit and partially latent in what Douglas is saying. Um, now, as to the Old Testament prophets, I do think the distinction here is it's not clear to me they have much of a, 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 an awareness of the Greek alternative. So I, I, speaking of where this project would like to go in the future, I do want to spend some time with the Old Testament prophets and I've begun to poke around there a little bit. But I've been straining my brain to find examples of persuasive rhetoric in the Old Testament. Um, I can think of something that, of, of failed attempts that get close, like when Abraham tries to negotiate with God um, over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, but it seems to me in some ways that the Old Testament prophets don't count as theorists in the way that Douglas does, because they're not attuned particularly to alternative modes of communication. Um, I, I'm not prepared to die on that hill. I can think of examples that might almost count. So um, I think, is it Samuel who sort of tries to illustrate to David the wrong he's done with Bathsheba by giving that example of the rich man who, who steals the poor man's goat and then and David comes to some realization of, of what he's done with Bathsheba and, and Uriah. Um, but the, the, the examples are few and far between. And it doesn't, it, it seems to me that it may be that the, the Old Testament prophets almost exclusively spoke in a, in a hortatory or merely informative way. The other, the other side of this is thus saith the Lord, like God just told me this and I'm passing you along this information. Um, but again, I'm not, I'm not willing to die on that hill. So I'm happy, <laughs> to, I'm happy to, be per, to be persuaded um, that the, the uh, there is, there's more going on. No, I, I totally, I totally agree with you, and I think right there for the larger project will be a difference between uh, when you you have both persuasive and hortatory rhetoric, and when you have only hortatory rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So right there you have a thing. And now I'm thinking, what about? It's just a suggestion. What about connecting the the prophets of the Old Testament with what's going on right now on the social media. And you mentioned MAGA and whatnot, but what about Black Lives Matter and so on and so forth? So I think you have here something to work with comparing the Old Testament with what's going on right now. It's just my... So let's let other people get into the conversation and then you can come back yeah. to that, Michael. So I have Jeff, Daniel, Jean-Pierre, Alex, and Jacob. So, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, so, uh, I guess the question is about the concept of auditory rhetoric, because I, I mean, maybe we can, it, it strikes me that the, the, the concept of auditory rhetoric is incorporating a couple different phenomena that I would want to maintain to be separate. So for example, I mean, sometimes you use the example in your, in your paper in here of the idea of a pep talk, um, you know, like before a football game or something, or I think similarly in the case of war speeches, like with Winston Churchill, right? Where the idea is you're sort of rallying the troops, you're pointing towards some kind of common goal and you're talking about the honors that could be won. It's a, 
and, and in a way that's that's like a super old very old mm -hmm. maybe as old human <laughs> language old form of rhetoric to sort of you know gather together a tribal consciousness in order to you know fight against outsiders so it, you know kind of connected fundamentally with like sort of martial valor and so but that seems to me to be very different than what um douglas is, is doing sort of the fourth of july speech which is not rallying the troops i mean that seems to me to be you know what he's doing is actually uh, you know shaming the troops. i mean shaming the troops would be if winston churchill would have shamed the troops that would have been a weird <laughs> approach right so like there's, you know, but but it's a shit, you know, it's an appeal to a kind of moral, a moral conscience rather than a form of tribal identity or something like that, right? Which is very different. It's a very different kind of. It seems to me that you know you were asking earlier about the sort of psychology and how your account of the psychology is right. It seems to me that these are working at, in, you know, in, in two different kind of psychological registers. So maybe you could say a little bit more about why you think maybe those two things should be more aligned psychologically than, than they seem to me to, to be. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree entirely with you that they're quite different and that the former may be as old as, as time itself. Like I think there's a decent case to be made um, that Pericles funeral oration largely takes place in this register, right? Um, maybe not entirely, he's trying to persuade the women to stop crying, but he seems mostly to be trying to, to encourage people to buck themselves up. Um, and that shaming is a totally different thing. And I, I'll, 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 I'll double down on this line of reasoning and say, there's a whole other kind that seems to be, I, I don't know if, I'm, if this is even a, an adjective, but consolationary, the kind of um, speech which says like, you know, I know you've had a rough time of this, but you know, you're doing a good job, pick yourself up, pull yourself together. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm open to being persuaded that I should distinguish them more. The reason I include them all together is because they seem to partake of this distinction with persuasion, that all of them fit into this category of not trying to change people's judgments about what it is that they ought to do. All of them take people's judgments about what they ought to do for granted and then appeal, apply or appeal to different features of, of human psychology to get them to do what the, what the audience already thinks it ought to do. And I, I'm inclined to say that it's characteristic of someone who is particularly good at this kind of rhetoric to be able to read an audience and tell which of these would be most appropriate. That is to say, um, and it may be that it's Douglas's reading of an anti, of, of the sort of mood and mindset of an anti-slavery society that would lead him to think that um, shaming in this case would be better than consolation. You know, you could go to the same society and go, look, I know you've been trying for a really long time in the service of this abolitionist cause and you might be dispirited, but take heart. Um, and that it's, it's part of his essentially Aristotelian sort of phrenesis to judge in this particular case, which is needed. Um, I also think I, I'm, I'm at least, Suspicious. I suspect that the demagogic, demagogic speech also is often in this register and appeals to a wholly different side of human psychology, um, appeals to the passions that reason really has suppressed, um, but sort of tries to, to elevate them over the, the reason that's trying to like stay king of the hill. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that's a persuasive account of why, because I don't want to pretend that the same kind of psychological strings are being plucked in each of these cases, only that the plucking is being done in the service of something that isn't getting them to make a different judgment than the one that they currently have. So yeah, I, I think that would be, that's how I would respond. That's to that. good. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, if you are intending to make a psychological case here, which I took it you were intending to, mm. to, to be doing in the paper, if there is a lot of psychological complexity in the auditory account, it might need to be disentangled more in the way that you were suggesting. But anyway, that's it. Yeah, okay. no, I, I agree with that. And I think that's also part of the, the, the larger book project sort of job is to say, that this, is, this is a sort of massive umbrella term for a whole host of different kinds of speech, 
whose, whose primary commonality is just that they're not trying to get you to change your mind. Um, but yeah, no, I take that. Okay, I have Daniel, jean Alex, uh, Jacob, uh, Liz, and Devon. So Daniel. Thanks so much for the paper. I enjoyed it and learned from it. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Pericles. Um, I, I mean, I suppose I want to ask whether there isn't an ancient analog to um, hortatory rhetoric. Um, I noticed that the epideictic rhetoric is not mentioned in the paper. Um, and if memory serves what Aristotle says about that type of rhetoric um, in book one of the rhetoric is that um, the actions described by the rhetorician aren't, aren't at issue. Everyone agrees about what happened. And the question is just amplification or beautification. Um, and isn't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, so why, is, isn't that what Pericles does say in the funeral oration? Didn't the Athenians have a whole institution devoted to this type of rhetoric? Um, and I guess a final question then is, um, is, is whether, I don't know, like I, I wonder whether Douglas isn't doing something different from either um, exhortation and um, on the one hand and persuasion on the other in this speech. I mean, for sure, I think, you know, the exhortation, the shaming, all that's there. But I've always been struck by how he both begins and ends with the founding documents. Right. Um, and so I wonder whether like Pericles in the funeral oration, he's trying to kind of illuminate our regime and its principles. Oh, good. Okay, so I, I, um, I'll try to respond to both of those. I, I'm, the, the issue of epideictic rhetoric is one that I've been trying to think about with respect to Aristotle. Now, it, seem, it seems to me um, that that kind of rhetoric, though, is distinct from this, precisely in that epideictic rhetoric, at least in its, at least as I read Aristotle describing it, is hmm, what would be modern analogs of it. They tend to be things like um, what you would say at a memorial service which I'll come to the funeral oration in a moment, but what you would say at like an ordinary memorial service or even at an after or a toast at someone's wedding um, where you're not aiming at bringing about any particular action. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be moved on this a little bit, but, but the Athenians do have an institution like this, right? Look, but it is, it's institutionalized. It's like someone is to be brought in to, to praise this kind of virtue or to praise this man for holding these kinds of virtues as we lay him to rest. And it may be that you, you want, um, it's clear that you want to beautify those, the virtues that are in question, um, but it's not at all clear that you want people to go do a particular thing that they already uh, want to do. In some ways, what the rhetorician is doing there is essentially showing off their skill at how well they can beautify the thing in question. Now that, that's my reading of Aristotle and epideictic rhetoric, but I'm happy to, to be pushed back on in this. With the Pericles funeral oration, it does seem to me he does have, I, I'm prepared to, to read the funeral oration, at least in part, as an example of hortatory rhetoric. And I think the Greeks have plenty of other examples that one could imagine, um, as do the Romans. I do think that the theory didn't quite catch up to the practice, and I think in some ways, I think Aristotle and, and for that matter, Plato are completely consistent in their um, sort of uh, silence about this kind of rhetoric because of the explicit accounts of psychology that they give. Um, I will say that one of the reviewers for this paper said like, maybe the reason Aristotle doesn't talk about it is because he has a low opinion of anyone who doesn't have sufficient self-command to be able to follow up on their judgment. Um, but, for, but Aristotle explicitly says that when it comes to political rhetoric, that once we've decided about a thing and made up our minds about it, there's no further use in talking about it. And that does seem to me to be sort of like a decisive smoking gun in the question of whether or not the theory caught up to the practice of this kind of speaking. Um, as to the, the founding documents and Douglas, um, I wouldn't even object to the idea that he's he's attempting to illuminate the regime. I think it's possible. I think he's doing a whole bunch of different things in that speech, not all of which is is hortatory. So, um, as I say in the paper, there's a whole other section in that speech where he does, I think, try to persuade people that Garrison is wrong 
about the Constitution, uh, that it's not a you know pact with the devil. It's it's in fact a glorious liberty document. Um, and I think it's also it's it's quite possible that he would also be engaged in some sort of um, pedagogical uh, you know project of trying to teach about um, the American regime. I also think though that the the inclusion of the the American founding documents in the in in the speech could map on pretty well though to a prophetic to prophetic purposes as well, which is that they function like the holy text or word of God that everyone says that they agree to, but you look around and nobody's doing the thing that we all collectively sort of uh, grant uh, you know, allegiance in word, if not in deed, and that you're being confronted as the prophets would do with essentially your hypocrisy and betrayal of you know, our common civic you know, catechism or, or what have you. Okay, next on the list is jean -Bierre. Hi, Michael. Uh, thank you so much for this paper. I really enjoyed it. It's excellent, so congratulations. Um, so that said, I have a few uh, concerns, questions, uh, so I'm gonna phrase them. Um, so the first is a concern about your method. Um, and I'm really not, I mean, I, it's just something genuine as I was reading. At some point I was like, why exactly are we talking about Aristotle when it's very clear that Douglas had not read Aristotle, but had read Aristotle mediated through the Latin tradition. Uh, so Cicero and then Quintilian, of course. So I just I just find it odd, just methodically how you built your paper, because it seems that, so either you're saying, well, there are these two conceptual options, so to speak. So, okay, that's one way of looking at it. But really it seems that you want to say something about transmission that is actually opposing a certain kind of rhetoric because it's really not opposing Aristotle. He doesn't know Aristotle. He, so so I, 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 I was just finding that really odd. And in particular, because your paper really revolves around a particular uh, specific interpretation of Aristotle, um, which you, know, you don't have a lot of space to explain it. So you have to simplify. You're don't, not talking about how Aristotle talks about emotions and all that. I understand it's just, to, you know, you can't do that, but because it's really had read Quintilian. And so yeah. really, how does that work? Are you doing a, a history of political thought as in the history of some kind of transmission and how he was, uh, he was responding to that? Or are you doing something different, which is just saying, well, there are these two conceptions and here they are opposed. So that's my first question. Um, and what it's connected, in fact, is that when you are thinking about uh, the question of rhetoric in the Roman context, there's really this question of the status of the speaker. And one of your reviewers said, well, you know, Douglas is not Cicero, and certainly is not, in the sense that in the Roman tradition, the speaker would be a free man who has a certain dignitas. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that Douglas just cannot inhibit. Um, and so he takes a different stance. Um, and I think his position totally makes sense, but also because that was something that was, in a sense, taken away from it by the very foundation of this sort of Republican or rhetorical tradition. And so I was surprised that you would not talk about that. So that's my second point. And that's my third point, and then I'm done. Um, the other thing that I found a little odd, and I was wondering if you could uh, say more about this, is that you seem to be saying, well, this one option about Aristotle, where um, you know, if you if you're given reasons, then you're convinced, and then that's it, and you're gonna act upon your reasons. And then you know, well, there's this should be this other tradition that you know we see in Douglas, which is that in fact we need this this passion, these emotions, we need to be psyched up in order to act, and we don't act upon reasons. But there's a huge philosophical tradition that says that reason. Uh, that that yeah that that reason doesn't make us act. That reason is inert in terms of uh, in, in motivational terms, right? And it's the human tradition. And I'm I just found it odd again that in your paper there was no this like it's as if there's this huge gap and there's nothing in between. So yeah, so those are my three points. I was just wondering, and I totally understand that you cannot, you know, it's just, it's one paper, but you also have the book. So I was, I was wondering if you could maybe um, say something about that. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So the first, the first point is actually quite easily dispensed with, which is you've put your finger on the one part of the paper I sent out to all of you that was not submitted to AJPS. So I, I basically in what submitted to, to AJPS just cited 
the, the full length piece I'd published on Aristotle and Cicero. Um, but it seemed unreasonable to expect people to track down that, that citation and then read the whole argument in order to follow what comes next. But this it does build on that. And so instead I did try to distill that essentially into three paragraphs, which I inserted into what I sent out to everyone else. The reason I do use Aristotle is because he's, and I, I say this as someone whose first book is, is primarily on Cicero, Aristotle is, is clearer and more precise on this question. And so in order to make the, the theoretical rather than, than transmission distinction, I find Aristotle more useful here. When you get to Cicero, Cicero is a bit more, I mean, there's no other way to put it. He's a bit more muddled. Um, he defers to Aristotle on a whole host of theoretical issues. But then when he starts talking about what he does in political rhetoric, he, he bleeds very far into the hortatory register. Um, and it is more the Cicero, it's, it's Aristotle filtered through, you're right, Aristotle is filtered through Cicero and Quintilian in say the Columbian Orator, which is the, the book of rhetoric that, that Douglas learned as a, as a child. Um, but that work as well, just rather than giving a series of citations to Aristotle or for that matter, really Cicero and Quintilian, um, just sort of like summarizes their thought and then gives a series of examples that all conform to that example. So, so my favorite of these is, Douglas makes a lot of the, the, the sort of speech in which a slave persuades the master to let him go. And the, the, to, use a, to use a hackneyed phrase, the unforced force of the better argument makes him release his, his slave. Um, to come to the issue of dignitas, I do think, I think you're right that Douglas doesn't have dignitas in the way someone like Cicero would. I think it is fair to describe though his approach to speaking as maybe an attempt to, reconstruct, to construct a new kind of dignitas that people should have to respect. Um, and in fact, I do think part of what's going on in Douglas's frequent downplaying of any sort of uh, formal theoretic schooling, gives, he, he sort of deliberately gives the impression of being not just an autodidact, but essentially like a savant. He says like, I had no preparation when I gave my first speech and it went wonderfully. Um, that's a way of get, like getting a new kind of dignitas that goes along with being essentially a genius that I think that I think he he exploits a little bit, um, uh, perfectly reasonably I think. Um, as to as to the last to, to the the human the, the the idea that that reason is simply not efficacious at all, I think is is perfectly reasonable. It is something that can that I would like to deal with in the larger book project. As far as I could track down. It wasn't a concern of, of Douglas's. Um, and, um, it, and, and so for that reason alone, it seemed like in a, in a paper that was already pushing the limits of word count in which I'm gonna have to find in, in addition, still more things to cut. Um, it just wasn't worth getting into here, but it is entirely worth getting into if I'm going to render an account of this kind of speech you know, wholesale. So I, I take that on board entirely. If I could just interlard one comment. It is very interesting that producers of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar almost invariably prefer to have African-American actors play Julius Caesar because their dignitas is believable, whereas the dignitas of white actors is not as believable in any case. Uh, next is Alex. Thank you so much. I was also extremely impressed with the quality of the paper and the argument, and I thought there's really a lot of substance here. The part of me that was maybe a little skeptical was wondering, I think maybe along the lines of Jean Viev, is do we actually need Acrasia for Douglas's psychological account and for his account of hortatory rhetoric to get off the ground? Because it seems to me maybe a modern reading of this is you have in groups and out groups, and you have different premises that these groups are operating from. And so when you're speaking to a group that agrees with you, you're going to start from a much uh, further along up the tree. Like we agree about X, Y, and Z, and we're only really disagreeing here. And, and maybe there you really do want to use more of the shared emotional register to get the people to see what you're seeing. Whereas the further away you get, the more you have to slowly walk people towards your premises. That could have different emotional registers and consequences. And it didn't seem to me there was anything specific in what you give us from Douglas, and I, I am not a Douglas scholar by any means, but nothing in what you gave me seemed to suggest that only by rejecting acrasia can we have this hortatory rhetoric. And if I'm right about the in-group, out-group, 
it sort of explains why you can't do it at the same time always like in a mixed crowd of people who are in group and out group you can speak a little bit but most of the time you know which of the groups you're talking to is it an in group or an out group most of the time those people don't like each other a ton so that's why they accuse you of being of pandering or being a demagogue when you try to speak to too many people and so you you could get a lot of the the conflict the normative and the practical stakes it seems to me without acrasia so why did you entangle that in and is it necessary for douglas or just for you in the book yeah, okay. You no, know, this is this is a good question. I think um where do I want to start with it? So, I think it's I I find it totally plausible that that um different audiences might be closer and further away from you and that when you when you're merely when you're trying to persuade those two different kinds of audiences, you may get to start at a much um like as you say further along the track. And so you can you can engage shared emotional responses as well much more easily than to people to a heterogeneous audience. Um, I think that's what Douglas is doing on the question, say, of is the Constitution a, a pro or anti-slavery document. I think that's what he's doing when he's debating with other well-meaning people about you know uh, the colonization projects of essentially sending freed slaves to Africa. Um, those are people who are much further along the track as far as Douglas is concerned. And when he engages them, he engages in persuasion that that does that plays on the emotions, but but which is, I think, still persuasion in the strict sense of they still on the question at hand is the Constitution an anti-slavery document. Should we send blacks to Africa? They disagree with him and they need their minds changed. And I I want to stand on the ground though that when it comes to this other the this this red meteor part of the speech um douglas doesn't assume that minds need judgment needs changing on anything um and i think i think this is the case for other sorts of 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 speech as well and i would say i wonder if if this would um be persuasive on the subject of why i think acrasia in a sense is needed for this which is i also think that accuracy itself, and if you look at the way the Greeks deal with it, and certainly the way the concept makes sense to me, um, you can have it in the strong or the weak sense. So in other words, you could know what you want to do and simply not do it at all, right? That's that's me, or no, sorry, that's the friend of mine, the hypothetical friend of mine who knows he should be preparing for a talk, um, but is instead watching videos of animal friendships on YouTube, right? I'm just not doing the thing that I ought to do. The, the weak, the, the sort of like attenuated version of it though, is where you're doing it, but you're not trying that hard, right? Um, where you're doing it half-heartedly. And so I do think that's the one where like sports pep talks are a perfect example of it. Like they're gonna go out and play the game, the, the second half, right? But it's a question of whether or not they're going to put out, you know, maximum effort or if they're going to just sort of like, you know, the bad news, but like sad sack their way through the second half. Um, and I tend to think, again, as I try to consult my own experience, right? Like if I go to, if I go to work out in the gym, right? And I don't have my headphones with me, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm going along on the stationary bike, but I'm not enjoying myself and I'm probably not pedaling all that hard. And something about putting headphones in with some sort of like fat, paced music makes me bike faster despite providing me with zero arguments right and despite like there's no like eye of the tiger doesn't like have a series of persuasive propositions that get me to change my mind right um it just it just makes it just touches me on on a on an emotional level despite the fact that i already knew i should have been pedaling harder and i tend to think that there is a that's distinct in this kind of speech so anyway that's that's how i would respond to that Okay, Jacob. So, um, this is really interesting. And um, something I thought of that sort of goes beyond this sort of goes to, to a broader project is there's a lot of examples you had for today of this type of rhetoric in our um, polarized climate. Um, but there's sort of a, an opposite example um, from the recent election in Germany where um, I read a piece like uh, I, I found a, a version of it in The Guardian where like Olaf Schultz, the uh, candidate for the SPD, um, so it took the lessons of Brexit in the 2016 election and said, I'm going to um, campaign differently here. So um, he gave a speech I'll go here, where he at a rally where he said, 
why did Britain vote for Brexit if it was against its own interests? Why did America vote for Trump? I believe it's because people are experiencing um, deep social insecurities and lack of appreciation for what they do. And he was like emphasizing things with respect. And like for people at the rally, that rouses way fewer people than talking about like baskets of deplorables and things like that. But, um, and I think part of it is sort of, um, is like he knew that like campaigning on that wouldn't, based on the like breakdown of the, the, the likely vote wouldn't be like, successful so i'm just thinking about like it seems like they're almost trying to do is to take people who would be like motivated on the other side and take them maybe they maybe they're not going to vote for the spd but they're, they're they might go from voting for um another party or an opposition party to not voting um at all so just thinking about how it's sort of a, a type of rhetoric where you're sort of you're speaking to people on the other side and saying you know actually no you should go from action to just thinking what you believe but not acting on on that yeah, it's it's interesting. I had I had not heard of this of this example, but I'm I've I have thought, for instance, that there is something that's in the same register that's the opposite of hortatory rhetoric, also, which is like de hortatory rhetoric, right? Like deflationary rhetoric, yeah. where the where the speaker is trying to just take the wind out of people's sails, you might say. Um, I'm trying to think if I can think of any example. I would say the first half of, of, of Mark Antony's funeral speech in, in, in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar might be something like that. It then turns to persuasion, I think. But like if you were to cut his speech off where um, you know the, the crowd is all like riled up thanks to Brutus and, and Antony just sort of like reminds them of how much they used to love Caesar and you can sort of like see the crowd kind of like, like start to, to lose some of their rage and energy. Um, like if you cut the speech there, I could I could imagine that being a sort of example. Um, so no, I, I'll have to think more about this, I guess, because I like the the intuition is very plausible to me. I just don't know what I, I just don't know what I want to I would make of it yet. But I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I'll email the article to you, to you after. Um, so one thing that I think might be like that are sort of like traditional concession speeches where like a candidate wow. is like yeah. conceding and then they're and then they, and not like concessions now because they don't have to say it, but like like <laughs> when um when like they talk about um, the, their opponent and congratulate them on the win and the people start to boo and they say, no, no, you shouldn't boo, you know, they won and that, you know, everyone's sad then. Yeah, no, I think, I actually think that's a better example than the one I had, the, the, than the, the Julius Caesar speech, that those, those do seem, you know, that you might get some persuasion too, like to the extent they try to persuade their followers not to go like burn the city down or yeah. whatever. Um, but some of it does seem to be a de-escalationary, rhetoric where you are just trying to calm people you know like you know this the, the candidate is probably the most upset person in the room who also would like to burn the place down um and they try instead to to produce the opposite emotion of action you know i appreciate that thanks mm -hmm. uh liz thank you um yeah so thank you michael i loved this paper i got so much out of it and um, I apologize for bringing up a thread that I think someone's already asked, Jeffrey asked this question, but I want to return to it partly because I actually think, so he was, you know, looking at, uh, there are possibly differences um, within this camp um, that you're not um, necessarily uh, sort of, you know, laying out for us. And it's possible that in the first part of the paper, it may not matter as much. But the reason I want to pick back up on this is because I think it really actually does matter. I think the distinctions will matter, partly from for where you start. So when you were kind of laying out what motivated this project, and then I think also where you end. So the final section where you're turning to the normative and moral sort of stakes of introducing the distinction between the hortatory and persuasive um, rhetoric. And then uh, I guess what I'll say one question is just, I wasn't totally sure what you were trying to do in the final section. Mm -hmm. Cause I kept thinking to myself, so wait a second, are you now concerned that hortatory rhetoric would become more right. prominent in contemporary politics? Is that what you were trying to get at in that final section? I wasn't quite sure, but then to backpedal from that, I was thinking to myself, well, actually this distinction is really important, right? So the difference between the pep talk in the locker room and the shaming. And I think that the hortatory rhetoric that Douglas is engaged in is much more risky, um, right? Because you are shaming, right? There's, there's a risk factor there that I don't think we necessarily see in the contemporary examples that you mention. And I, so I'm thinking, you know, 
both sides, uh, you know, Trump isn't shaming his crowd. He's definitely inciting action for sure. But I don't think it's happening in, in the same form of shaming. Similarly, you start with Cornell West at one of Bernie Sanders um, campaign rallies. And I don't think that those are meant to be shaming those who are present. It's certainly shaming those who are not present. So again, I, I think this distinction is important. And I wonder if not attending to it is actually undermining the very strength of what Douglas is doing in his version of hortatory rhetoric. Um, because he is taking that risk. He is shaming his audience and he's really not holding back at all in terms of how he's doing that. And so I wonder, you know, bringing it to the kind of contemporary context, I'm sitting, I've been sitting here wondering since I read this this morning, do we have room for that in our contemporary context with, with the severe polarization? Um, so I think it'd be wonderful if we had that, um, but it would be, it's almost because we're so polarized, people are really afraid to shame and risk ostracizing those who are kind of in their camp. But think about how useful it would be if we had actually done that. I'm thinking of the many, you know, Republicans that could have done some hortatory rhetoric with their own Republican base shaming. And I know some politicians did do start doing some of this eventually, right? Shaming them, knowing that they know what's right. I mean, think of the number of people you talk to during the election season who said they don't love some of the things that Trump's saying, but they're still going to vote for him. And I'm thinking on the other side, I can't tell you the number of people I talk to who said they really prefer Bernie's platform, but they're going to vote for someone else. So I think those are actually opportunities for the very strength of hortatory rhetoric in the register that you're presenting it with Douglas. So I would kind of encourage you to go through those distinctions and kind of double down and show, like to me, that is the strength of what he's doing. So I guess the question is, I got confused about what you were trying to get at in the final section. And then I'm also kind of, I guess, pushing and suggesting that you possibly rethink it by attending to those distinctions, because I actually think there's a lot of conceptual and analytical power in that, especially for the contemporary context that, that you start with and kind of end with. No, I, I really appreciate both of both of these comments. So I'll, I'll start with what I was getting at in the conclusion, because I, you know, I, I think at one point you you were asking like, should we? Am I trying to say we should be concerned about it? Or and I'm trying to I'm trying to take a sort of nuanced position where on the one hand I'm trying to say against some of the contemporary theorists about rhetoric that this kind of register is a completely at least potentially legitimate way of speaking in politics. So I'm thinking about, you know, Brian Garston, his book is great and I, I'm entirely in favor of the defense of persuasion, but at some points he says, you know, rhetoric is only legitimate when it's for the sake of persuasion. And on the one hand, I want to make the case that it's legitimate in, even when you're not trying to persuade some of the time. But I also don't want to pretend as though I, I would relish a politics that consists exclusively of hortatory rhetoric. And I'm in fact inclined to say that we may have too much of it already of a certain kind, where you do give the impression that there's nothing to be said on the other side. So I think that's where, where Douglas is illustrative as it seems to me Douglas is, is often quite um, aware that at least when speaking purely in the hortatory register, it tends to be confined to issues like the, the, the actual justness of slavery, where I think we would tend to agree with him, there is nothing legitimate to be said on the other side, whereas lots of people today, I think, speak in the same register where there really is things to be said on the other side. And when you give an audience the impression there's nothing to be said on the other side, you make persuasion possibly impossible and, and possibly cultivate all sorts of other political pathologies that we could discuss. Um, as for the the issue, the distinction between shaming and the pep talk and whether or not there's more risk um, in shaming, I think there definitely is more risk to the speaker in shaming because yeah, it's possible that the audience responds as, as most of us do when we're shamed defensively um, rather than contritely. Um, I do think though it's possible, there were risks attendant on the other as well, which is if you rile people up for the sake of one goal, and the goal isn't achieved. Well, you've just got a lot of riled up people now who are who who may go do something else. I think um, 
again, to keep it out of politics for the moment. Like if, if, if at a sports stadium, they're trying to rile up their fans to support the team and then the team loses, occasionally they walk out of the stadium, right? And set fire to a bunch of dumpsters, um, which didn't help the cause for which they were being revved up, right? It doesn't change the score of the game. Um, I do think, I'm, I'm open to push back on this as well. I think you're right that there um, is less opportunities for shaming now in a whole lot of the speech that we see in politics. Um, and that there may be something like a lack of the dignitas I was talking about with John Viev, that like you need a certain level of dignitas for, a, for an audience to go along with you on this. And it may be the case that, that many of our, our leading political speakers lack it in the relevant sense. Um, though, the, though the place I would imagine it more likely to occur, though, though I haven't haven't been in quite some time to anything that would that would meet this description, is at something like a protest march, where you might imagine that a speaker at the end or a rally where, where it's not for a particular political candidate, but it's for some sort of cause in which I could at least very easily imagine someone getting up and giving a speech to the supporters of, you know, the National Wildlife Fund or something to like pick something relatively nonpartisan. Say like, yeah, you all showed up on the for the march today, but how many of you are going to go home and make regular donations to your local um, to your local conservancy? How many of you are going to volunteer to help you know clean up? And basically, I can at least imagine someone giving that kind of speech where it's like, oh sure, you showed up for the performative element of our political cause, but where are you when it comes to actually doing the work? Um, which would be, it seems to me, a very uh, uh, Douglas inflected style of speaking that I think there may be still room for. But thank you. Uh, I have one more. Uh, Aline would like to have another question, but I'd like to ask a question first. And this goes to a perplexity that I've had. For, I mean, I, help, I think your paper helps to answer this. Uh, during the 2016 election, I tried to, you know, as a good political scientist slash theorist, explain to people why there were problems with Trump's position. And every time, and on Facebook and, and Twitter, but especially on Facebook, and every time I would do that, there would be five or six Trump reporters that would say, oh, you're just a flaming liberal. Well, I mean, it wasn't true, but still, it, it, it so it led me, I, I always wondered, why can't I persuade them? I'm giving them all the information. But it occurs to me that one of the things about the repetition of Portatory rhetoric is that it transforms your hearers, right, into thinking that anybody that says anything against this position must be evil or stupid or wrong. And in that sense, it's connected to something like a Manichaean tradition. And that I think your mentioning of Augustine at one point was very useful in that respect because it is like, okay, you're a sinner, right? You, you, I can't listen to you at all because you just, you know, you want Hillary Clinton. And even though I'd said, no, I don't want Hillary Clinton, I want somebody else. They, they just couldn't believe that, right? So I wonder if there isn't a larger, let's say political effect mm -hmm. of using this kind of rhetoric, um, and especially if it's more Manichaean, which inoculates your supporters against being persuaded. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I essentially agree with that almost almost wholesale. I think it does it does that. I think not only through repetition, but it places Aristotle's right. I think about persuasion, which is you often need to put your your audience first in a specific kind of emotional mindset before they're in a position to change their minds. And the repetitive nature of hortatory rhetoric and the constant nature of it. Um, and actually, I'll add something on top of that too. The fact that I think people have gotten better at it. And there is a certain kind of pleasure you experience when on the receiving end of hortatory rhetoric. That's, that's different and I think more intense. Most of us are, I mean, I frankly am annoyed when I'm persuaded of something oftentimes, right? Like it bothers me. It, it bothers me when someone forces me to change my mind about something, right? And you don't feel that when you get a pep talk, right? You enjoy it. And I think that's partly why people seek it out and why you would go onto Facebook to get your opinions reinforced. You know, like you go and actually seek out your daily dose of exhortation because it's, you know, it's energizing. I mean, I. You know, I, I, if you, if I enjoy reading Churchill's, we shall fight them on the beaches now 
when I need some sort of like oomph and motivation, right? Um, but I do think the consequence of this is that you essentially are armoring your, your partisans against hearing in the first place. Um, and so, no, I'm, I, I, entirely, I entirely agree with this. And it's one of the many things I sort of gesture towards at the end of the paper, but which can't be just for the reasons of length, can't be sort of developed here, but which again, I hope to develop in the, the much larger project. Can I just jump in on this point? But because it seems to me that actually this is this doesn't get Douglas right though, and I do, I don't I mean just the double down again on the shaming on the, I'll I'll concede that yeah, right away. I mean, because I nobody is, likes I, being shamed. I, I take it this was kind of the question I asked, and that Liza sort of developed I think well here because it seems to me actually Douglas the effect of Douglas's speech ideally is not to polarize; it's actually to shame the Northerners. To bring them closer to the Southerners, right? Because they're they 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 are uh, you know responsible for this just like the Southerners are. So I mean, the older tribalist form of hortatory rhetoric is polarizing. But I it, at least it seems to me actually I mean one of the powers of Douglas's rhetoric is it might not be polarizing. Actually, it might be depolarizing. I wonder. So so this I think it's possible though. This sits a little uneasily with and I now forget whose earlier comment it was, that Douglas's speech may have a polarizing effect on the people who, he's, who he knows are not in his camp, right? So yes, he, may, he brings, he brings his, his supporters, let's call them for the moment, closer in their own self-understanding to the Southerners. Like, well, you're not so different from the Southerners. You two share the blame and guilt and sin of slavery. And so you shouldn't feel nearly as morally superior as you probably are feeling as you sit here in this anti-slavery society. But just as he's making these, this, this fiery ridicule and biting reproach, um, I do think it's the case that on the other hand, he's not, he's not trying to lure the Southerners closer to the Northerners. Um, but I take your point that not all of the, and this, this does go to, to the point that, um, that both you and, and, and Liza have brought up, which is that yet yeah, not all of these kinds of, of hortatory rhetoric probably do have the same kind of um, they don't all produce the same kinds of political effects. We may call them side effects, right? Like in addition to getting your audience to do this one thing, it also has these, these other consequences for how they just are politically in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm prepared, I think, simply to, to acknowledge that and, and to hope to like, in a much, in a larger project, distinguish them better. And probably in this paper, just make it clear that not all of the consequences of all kinds of auditory rhetoric apply equally. Um, so yeah, okay. I take I take it on board. I had Anna who wanted to speak first and then we'll go to Eileen. So Anna. I'm sorry, Eileen, I took your spot. Um, um, so I thank you so much for the paper. I really enjoyed it. It was uh, very uh, enjoyable to read. Um, so that was really nice. Um, I have been a little bit hesitant to ask this question because it's it's not all the way a question yet. I'm still sort of trying to figure out what my, my, my concern really is. So I'm gonna present this more as like my thoughts and I'm gonna ask what, what you think about this and what your thoughts on this are. Um, so given some of the obvious problems that come with hortatory speech that um, uh, Michael Gillespie has just been mentioning and you know that you mentioned in the conclusion that it, it leads to polarization and has the potential of actually making persuasive rhetoric less likely to happen, I wonder if perhaps one of the best or only defenses of hortatory speech would be if it were an absolutely necessary type of rhetoric in order to um, get a particular political outcome to happen. Um, and so in the Aristotelian account of how rhetoric is supposed to work, the idea is that if I have used an argument effectively, and if I can persuade somebody um, and they change their mind, then necessarily they're going to act upon this. Mm. And then when we look at Aristotle's sort of understanding of the soul, that would presuppose that reason has a controlling authority over the other parts of the soul, in particular, sort of the, the will, the, the emotional part, I don't know what he calls it, uh, the appetitive part of the soul, right, will and mm. uh, desire. And you seem to suggest that um, Douglas kind of challenges that view of the soul, right? By saying that um, 
reason doesn't have that type of control over the soul. It doesn't have the ability to move the individual to do the things. Even if reason tells it, screams at the top of its lungs to say, do the thing, it's the right thing to do. The desire, the will might still go, eh, don't feel like it, not gonna do it. Um, and so then if that was part of the human condition, that reason is not always able to make us do the things we ought to do, then hortatory speech would become absolutely necessary part of the political process and as such would be an indispensable sort of complement of persuasive rhetoric. And so my question now is, do you really think that that is the case? Do you think that is part of the human condition that we cannot be made to do things exclusively based on reason? Or is it just kind of intellectual laziness? Um, have we just gotten, are we just unwilling to do the things that we ought to be doing? Does that make sense? I think it does. And so this is um, the, 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 the last distinction between this vision and, and the question of whether or not we are willing. I think this rests on a, on a vision of will. And it's not clear, as far as I can tell, even to, to Aristotle scholars, whether, for instance, Aristotle has a notion of the will or not, I'm, I'm somewhat inclined to suspect that he doesn't. Um, and that that might be in essentially the crucial missing component for someone to be able to theorize capably about hortatory rhetoric. And even there are modern uh, uh, debates in psychological and, and philosophy literature about whether or not the will exists either. There, there actually is some interesting attempts to prove that it does involving, you know, children and cookies and being able to restrain themselves from eating them once, eat, once you, once you're in, once you know that they understand that if they don't eat them right away, they get more cookies. Um, I, so, so I'm inclined both for those reasons and also just for, from introspection to suspect that this account, this vision of the soul is more accurate. That is, I find myself ecratic from time to time. So I gave you, you know, there was the example of that friend of mine who was watching um, the, the animal videos. Um, but to circle this over to your earlier question about, well, is it only legitimate in cases of necessity? Um, I think that's one possible conclusion one could draw, in which case someone like Douglas or Churchill are defended for their use of it because we're talking about uh, like the gravest and most urgent moral questions, you know, resistance to slavery, resistance to Nazism. I do have sort of a hope, and I, I again point to it a little bit in, at the end of this and, and also at the end of the other piece I've published on this subject, but there might be another way of looking at it too, which is what you really ought to shoot for is an appropriate fit between the urgency and importance of the cause and the amount of motivational force you bring to bear on the people listening. So thinking again about elections, right? Um, to say like, and again, these would be in argument form, but to, to um, I, it's hard for me to, to give the hortatory expression of them without having the context of a specific speech. But if you were to basically give people the impression um, that this election is the most important election in their history, that's one thing. To say this is the most important event in your life is another. And to say this is a very important election. And in fact, going to vote is both fun and your civic duty and something that we, you know, that you can feel a sense of solidarity with people around you and going to do, like are all I would view as various levels of, of motivational force being brought on people. And some of those seem to me totally legitimate. If your job, if what you're trying to do is get people to go out and vote for a particular candidate or a particular cause, right? But others, even if you're certain the cause is right, might be inappropriate for you to bring to bear on them, right? So like, say we were to assume for the sake of argument that you were arguing on behalf of someone who absolutely ought to win the election from a moral point of view. They are the better candidate, the other person is corrupt or evil or whatever. It still might be morally justifiable only to motivate your audience to a certain level because motivating them further than this and then having your candidate lose anyway might lead a bunch of revved up supporters who are at this extremely heightened state of emotional engagement to go do other things when the thing that you were trying to get them to do failed. And so, so I would try to defend a slightly broader scope for hortatory rhetoric on the grounds that there, that a responsible statesman or speaker or, or politician could find something like 
a fit, like an appropriate fit. But I'm not sure if that's persuasive, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting. So I'm trying to sort of navigate that that point where you're saying like, so they're, are they supposed to complement each other? Do they have to suppose to complement each other? And what is their connection? And so I wonder if we do go back to this idea of the soul and um, if we do think of hortatory speech as something that, you know, it's just necessary given the human condition then there is more of a pairing between the two, right? Then we would assume that the one has to follow the other, but it has to be sort of the handmaiden of the first, just as a consequence of the sort of the weakness of human nature, or is it more so that they're just two different devices that you know a person has available to them and they pick and choose mm. so I, I think there is there a more responsibility on the part of the orator to take account of the weaknesses of human nature or is it just i can just might as well appear appeal to either of your sentiments your rational or your emotional sentiments right okay i now i think i i understand better what you're getting at and it does seem to me and i don't i i would not I'd be doing an injustice if i didn't try to like flag this is that I think arguments often are perfectly sufficient to motivate us, right? Like often, uh, you know, if you if you thought smoking was fine and had no idea about its connection to cancer, and someone pointed out and per, you know showed you with reasons the, the 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 consequence that would have on you, I would suspect for most people that would be sufficient. You know, setting aside the issues of addiction and the, but but like there are lots of things whereby if you were simply given a series of reasons that's sufficient to persuade you. And that persuasion is in turn sufficient to get you to change your, your behavior. Um, and so I think some of the time when a when a, when an orator or, or a political actor is making these kinds of decisions, they should first ask like that primary question. So I suspect also on issues of what I would call like prudential self-interest, you often probably shouldn't require that much more, right? If you're just showing people that they will be better off in an immediate tangible sense by doing X rather than Y. I suspect a lot of the time, you don't need more than that. Though most people, and so, so I would say that um, a, my, my intuition at any rate at this stage is that a responsible orator does not simply go, well, which of these sort of modes do I feel like speaking in now? but has to read both the question at hand and also the audience in question. I do think that that goes back to several of the earlier comments about homogeneous versus heterogeneous audiences and how far along the path, I think this was Alex's point, uh, how far along the path are you uh, with the speaker? Um, but it's something I'd, I, like, I would like to think more about before I, you no, know, I appreciate you raising it for me. Thank you. Um, Michael, I think you're 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 uh, muted. My wife, who is a physician, who de who always tried to get her patients to stop smoking, when they would come in with a bad cough or a cold, she would always turn to hortatory rhetoric and to try to to tell them this this is what your rest of your life is going to be like. This is going to be excellent. So I think that that's, you know, there are clearly occasions when we all do things like that. We certainly do that with children as well when we're, when we're raising kids, right? I mean, there, there are occasions for that and, and there are occasions for persuasion. So um, anyway, I, I think, Je Jeff, I think we're, are we out of time? We have time for one more question. I'll, I'll have, okay, Alina, I'll have yeah, one more question. Before. Well, thanks. I, I'll try to be very short. And actually, this is very kind of like, uh, it's more self-interested. It's not for you, Michael, it's for me. <laughs> so basically, when, when you talk, I, I won't go into the smoking part because I just quit smoking oh. months ago, whatever. But uh, uh, about the, the shaming part, I would like to bring it back to the shaming part. I was thinking, because this is something I, I am working on. And I, I'm thinking on like when Socrates talks to Trasimachus and he's like a beast and whatnot in the Republic, right? He roars and whatnot. And at the end, he blushes. 
Socrates says, I've seen something I have never thought I would see Trasmahus blushing, which means that basically he was ashamed, right? Mm -hmm. But he was ashamed via, via persuasion, not via uh, hortation, right? So my, my question is like, which one of the two methods of shaming? So you, you have a, a good shaming and a, a wrong shaming. Let's put it very simple in these simple ways. But which of the two types of rhetorics do you think are better in terms of obtaining the effects of shame, or the, the right effects of the right shaming? So let's yeah. stick with the oh. let's stick with the with the with the smoking. Let's say, uh, like like uh, like the other bike said, uh, it's like oh shame on you, you are smoking whatever. Would that affect me or not? Yeah. So and and I know we have only got a couple of two minutes left. So I'll, I'll I think this is a good question. I'll just do my best to do justice. To yeah, just we've got left. In some ways, I wonder if I'd distinguish there between embarrassment and shame. So it seems to me like I might read Thrasymachus there as embarrassed rather than shamed. That is to say, um, he was caught out. That is, he was he was he was embarrassed. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I I bet you disagree here. Blushing, it's the the sign of shame. It's not okay. embarrassment. When you blush, you are ashamed. Oh, I, I tend to think I, I blush under both circumstances, but it's, I, I'll, I'll yield that. Um, uh, so, but I, I'm not even sure that the distinction is, is essential to, to what I want to say, which is that it seems like the kind of shame you're describing with Thrasymachus is the shame um, of having been shown up as, as mistaken in, in, in front of people who he who he wants to impress. Whereas yes. the shame of Douglas appear that the not Douglas's shame, but the shame Douglas tries to, to, to evoke in his audience is the shame of people who are confronted with not living up to the set of moral beliefs or the set of moral commitments or the vision of themselves that they have. And that, that disjunction, I think, is often the one that would be more politically salutary and useful to maybe retain or, or even revive in, in political discussion. Whereas the other, um, among other things, I think is hard to imagine functioning particularly well before a whole crowd and does seem like the sort of thing that worked in particular in that Thrasymachus was an individual who put himself in front of the crowd. That, that's a very good point. Thank you. Thanks. That helps, helps me a lot. <laughs> so thank you. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, Thanks and, to all of you. Uh, I, I really appreciate you coming. Yeah. And, and Jeff, do you have 